Welcome to Robert Bellissimo at the Movies. This is a YouTube video podcast exploring storytelling on film, as well as interviews with industry professionals who work in film, television, theater, among other areas of the arts. I want to welcome to the show Julian Davis, who is an actor, producer, writer, and musician. Some of her credits include House of Nine, Fear Frequency, and of course, Eyes Wide Shut, which we're discussing today, where she played the pivotal role of Mandy Curran. Julian, welcome. Thanks so much again for joining me. Hi, thank you, Robert, for, for having me. <laughs> my pleasure, my pleasure. Um, I just, before we talk about Eyes Wide Shut, I just wanted to go go back to your to your life story before that a little bit, because I know you started out as a ballet dancer. I and, did. And became a, a full-time model in the UK and in Europe. Um, and you, so you, you, you mentioned that you dabbled in acting a little bit before this film. Now, did you ever, did you have formal training? Um, it, by formal, if you mean acting classes, yes. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I didn't go to RADA, for instance. Right. Um, but uh, let's see, I have a very analytical brain. And, um, and so even though I did take um, acting classes with a lot of working actors sort of way early on, I think I was about 20, um, I would say that my acting has gotten better over the years just from being in the business, observation. And I would say the best training I actually ever had was um, with private coaches. Mm. So I did have a few private coaches and I wish I could name the name of one of them in England, but for the life of me, I can't remember her name, but she was excellent, <laughs> yeah. What what brought you to to go to to England? Did you have uh, some kind of offer to go there, or did you just go to see if you could make? Some you know, it's just it's just really weird how things happened. Um, I started off in Los Angeles. I am from Los Angeles, right? And then you know when I started modeling, I started modeling around the same time I was acting. Did some modeling in LA, and then I went off to Tokyo, came back to LA, then went to New York for a while, came back to LA, New York again, then moved to Europe. I was based out of Germany for the first year, and then I moved to England. And, um, and then from there, England really, I mean, I love England. Um, I'm a British citizen, a dual British American citizen. And I adore England and it became my main base. And I just felt it was home. It was home more than, you know, I hate to say it. I mean, more than how I felt at home in America. I, I feel really at home in England. And so it became my main base while I continued to travel around. And I, you know, and I did the whole, the typical working model thing, Paris, Milan, right. um, you know, Germany again for a while, Athens, um, oh, wow. you know, Holland, Spain, Bangkok, you know, it just, you know, oh my God. all over. Yeah. Wow. That must have been, that must have been some incredible experiences in all those major cities. You know, it was a fantastic career. And I'm not going to say I didn't have some hard times too. I did, but right. um, all in all, it was, it was a great, great career. I, um, I miss it. My last campaign was in 2012 as a model and I do miss it. And I, and I love it. And I, you know, I love fashion people. Um, and so, you know, and I got to travel to so many amazing places. Mm. So, you know, very grateful for that. And if it wasn't for that career, um, then I obviously wouldn't have met um, Leon Vitale, who was doing the audition for right. Eyes Wide Shut. And that sort of catapulted me back into acting. So I was pursuing acting a little bit in L.A., and, you know, I got a little role on a, on a pilot and, you know, just a few little odds and sods, but nothing of note, really. Um, and then, uh, so when I auditioned for Eyes Wide Shut, I already knew what I was doing when it came to acting. But, right. I mean, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be naive and think it, it didn't have a little bit to do with how all of this looked as well, you know. So, <laughs> right, right. You know, I mean, I'm not stupid. It's like, you know, I mean, I got, you know, I got lucky. I got lucky. I was the right person, I guess, for Stanley at the right place at the right time. I mean, that was, that was truly, you know, that's like hitting the lottery. I was, oh, I was a working much. model at the time. I wasn't a supermodel or anything like that. I was just, you know, a successfully jobbing model, fashion model. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, 
now because I, I know that you mentioned the initial audition was for Leon Vitale. And of course, yes. any, anyone who's a Kubrick fan knows who he is. He's like yes. Kubrick, Kubrick's exactly. right man, man. He was in exactly. and he was in Eyes Wide Shut, of course. Yes, as well. he was. Yep. Um, so now you you had mentioned that you had originally applied to be a, a background performer in it. Yeah. Um, and and so how how did it come about that? Well, it's funny. So my my agent rang me up and said, um, so would you be interested in auditioning as a, quote, featured extra in a film? Right. And I was ready to say, no, no way, not interested, because I wasn't. And, you know, I had plenty of work as a model. So why would I bother? Right. Um, and and then she said, it's a Stanley Kubrick film. And I went, oh, because, <laughs> you know, like so many people, I'm a huge Kubrick fan. So um, then she told me, she said, well, you're going to be a featured extra and you'll be wearing um, a mask and you will be wearing a mask, a G-string and high heels. Oh, God. <laughs> and the thing is, is that on one like hand, <laughs> well, on one hand, you know, people need to understand, even if you're a fashion model and not a kind of TNA glamour model, you still you're you you get after a while, you know, you get so comfortable with your body that I don't know a lot of fashion models that are really kind of shy, especially if you're doing catwalk shows, because, you know, while you see us walking glamorously down the, the catwalk, by the time we've left, if we have a really fast change, by the time we get back to our rack, to our rail with all our clothes on it and our dresser there and everything, we've already got everything pretty much off and we're down to our G-string again, you know? Right. And so you just don't think it's like, you know, you just don't think about it. Right. And so right. I was sitting there thinking, well, you know, not really, yeah, you know, just being that kind of virtually nude I, but then I thought well you know you're wearing a mask no one's gonna know who I am it'll be fine you know <laughs> and then they told me the money and I thought yeah it could be good you know so I said yes did the audition and then you know rang my agent at the end of the evening you know for whatever I was doing the next day and she said oh um so Stanley wants to meet you and, um, and so I went to, uh, to Pinewood. They had a driver come pick me up, take me to Pinewood, met with Stanley for a while. And then, um, and then they wanted me to come back a few times to do screen tests, which I did. Leon was coaching me for the screen tests. I did that. Two weeks of nail biting and then got the part. <laughs> it's incredible. Now, you, you had mentioned you were a big fan before this experience and and so when you get this phone call that oh stanley kubrick wants to meet you what is that drive like on the way there are you are you nervous are you think you know what, what was that what i mean you, you know i've met a number of famous people beforehand because you know the fashion world and the music world and the film world kind of you know that they, they cross over um i suppose i was excited, you know, interested to meet him, but was I nervous? Eh, you know, I was a little bit, ooh, <laughs> yeah. you know, but not, I wouldn't say I was fantastically nervous, no. And, and so what, what was that meeting? What, what was it? It was just, was it just a polite, cordial, you know, hello, how are you? Or yeah, no, he about? spent, he spent a few minutes sort of chatting with me and I guess he just wanted to size me up, you know? Oh, okay. Um, and well, one of the first lead ins, I think, I don't know, I'd like to think that he was impressed by it, but maybe not. I said to him, I said, you know, I said, my father was a computer engineer at JPL, which is an offshoot of NASA, you know, JPL, Caltech, NASA, that whole thing. Right. And I said, um, he was really impressed by the fact that, um, you, in 2001, you had no sound when the people were in, in space. Right. And I said, that was accurate. And I said, I don't know why so many other people are not accurate, including Star Wars, which is just pathetic. 
you know, you have like the, the zooming around, you know, but as there's no atmosphere, there is no sound. And the fact that I knew that, um, you know, then Stanley started asking a little bit more about, you know, my kind of pedigree, I guess, you know, so I was telling about my father and said, my uncle, my mother's brother was a nuclear physicist. So, you know, I didn't come from stupid stock. Right. No, for whatever reason, but you know, it could have been that it could have been all of this. Um, <laughs> Who knows? It could have been the fact that, you know, I wasn't terrible at being an actor. It, you know, it could have been any of those things. That's a good icebreaker, though. It's a bring, to yeah. bring that up. Yeah. And, you know, we, we laughed and joked and, you know, just chatted about general things. And, you know, it was good. I told him what films I liked by him. Um, my favorites being obviously 2001, Doctor Strange, Love and Lolita. Those are my three favorites. Oh, those are all incredible. And, and so this initial audition you had before meeting him, what, what did they ask you to do? <laughs> <laughs> initial audition, walk in, undress, have a G-string on with high heels as Leon had you do things like, I don't know, notice what was in the room and, you know, do some um, emotions, do some walking. I mean, it was really more like they were kind of checking what you, and this was for an extra okay. role, right? right? So it was okay. only then that, you know, I guess I got approval for this, right? right. <laughs> and then I was a, then, you know, for some reason, I guess, because I was speaking on camera, Leon was asking me questions and I was, uh, you know, talking about what experience I had had and an, as an actress and, you know, just a few sort of things I and, um, and, then I guess that was enough for Stanley to want to call me in. And were, now when you said you did the three screen tests later, now when you did that, was there dialogue? Two, there two screen tests. Sorry, two, two screen, screen tests. tests. Yeah. Was there a, a scene then that you had to do or, or, how, or was it different? Um, or yeah, was it was like? a couple of the scenes that I was doing. It was the, okay. um, it was the first scene, um, you know, in the chair. Right. I was passed out. Obviously the scene where I'm dead. You know, I'm dead. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that was hard. Um, and then the the scene where um, my character is standing on the balcony and says, "I will redeem him." Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So it was both of those. Yeah. It's interesting because because I, I I had thought that must have been hard when you were the when you were just when you were dead uh, later on because uh, now you know because because it was I, a really I, I long cut that. and you didn't see yeah. me breathing. That's exactly what I was thinking. I was like, how did you, I was thinking, how do you not keep your, your stomach from going, <laughs> going up and down, right? Well, I was you, holding my breath. And if you, you saw, I, right? you know, oh if God. you looked closely at my body, which I'm sure people <laughs> did, my, my, my um, ribs were kind of a little bit more out. So I did take quite a large breath. But the thing was, is that the whole thing, the whole scene moved so slowly. You know, Tom right. came in. And he slowly walked around me like this. Yes, yes. And at one point, so they had the whole group and they were watching me really closely. Everybody was watching me to make sure that I didn't breathe, move, oh my God. or blink because my eyes were open. I had That's to take right. my contact lenses out because my, contact, my contacts were drying up. Anyway, it was a whole thing. And, um, and so they made sure that I wasn't, breathing or moving. And, and obviously, you know, I was being disciplined, but at, there was a point where I knew I needed to breathe. And so Stanley said, okay, when you need to breathe, just say breathe. So I did, I said, breathe, took a breath, held my breath again. And then Tom continued to walk around me so that he was facing over me. And, um, and then we had to work out this whole thing where he's try doing this, try and keep your eyes absolutely dead straight when you have something moving over you because you it's really difficult because you right. want to go right. oh yeah <laughs> you want to you want follow. follow it right yeah so yeah th that was that aspect of it was tough you know and then also it was this constant rotation of the steel bed that I was on mm. you know the the steel right. what do you call those things the the I'm steel not sure. it's like yeah it's like a not a Whatever, bed, yeah, but you know, know it's you like mean, that in the, the morgue, pulley right. thing that comes out of yeah. it. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. So the thing is with steel is that it's cold. Cold, I figured. Right? But <laughs> you can't really have goosebumps on a corpse or like little hard, 
nipples on a corpse, right? <laughs> so we had we had constant rotation in the back of people literally putting hot blow dryers on these panels. We had a couple other panels we were rotating. Oh wow. Right. And so as soon as the panel started to get cold, or as soon as anybody noticed that I started to get goosebumps, then it's like, oh, okay, quick change panel, you know. And so it was this constant location, um, rotation of these panels. Oh my god. As um, so for me to stay warm enough, you know, and they tried to make the room warm, you know, but we were it it was shot in winter. We were in St. Albans in a in a disused, I think, bacon factory. <laughs> that they oh, wow. that they made into um, a morgue yeah oh so my it, was, God. it was it was a very interesting oh yeah and the other thing too so they wanted me to have no color um I was you know ask my entire yeah in yeah. my entire body and the um the makeup artist I believe his name was Robert now and I'm sorry I don't Sorry, Robert, don't remember your whole name. But look it up. We'll look it up. Um, we'll look it up. But <laughs> it was just, it was, it was actually kind of hilarious, you know. I mean, I think Robert's gay anyway, so it didn't really matter. But um, you know, he was just kind of had to paint my entire body white, you know, like kind of a bluey out. white. Yeah. Right. So my just, you know, everything that was seen. Obviously, he didn't have to do my back, but he had to do the entire front of me. And I said, <laughs> You know, it's like, how many days did we shoot that? It was something like 10 days shooting oh, that, wow. that scene, 10 days, My two God. weeks, something like, I mean, it's just crazy amount of time. Yes. And, you know, after a while, Robert would just say, yeah, it's just acres and acres of flesh. <laughs> you just have to cover. It's like acres of flesh. <laughs> Oh my that God. Was, yeah, I had always wondered. I had always wondered how. I mean, you literally look dead. I mean, it looks really good. I was like, how did they get her to look so white? I didn't, I didn't expect it to be uh literally paint. I thought maybe something with the lighting and combination of makeup, but wow. Yeah. That's uh that's quite something. And so you 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 would you mentioned you were there for eight, eight months. Uh <laughs> well, no, I was I well, I won't say, I mean, I wasn't on set for eight months, but I was paid for eight months. Right. You had because to they be wanted available. to make sure that I was see, so they couldn't release me and I wasn't allowed to take any other work. Right? Right. So right. I mean, even if it was like a day job, you know, like a catalog job or whatever else was or a commercial or whatever. I, I basically was on contract for eight months and not allowed to do anything else. So even if they weren't necessarily filming my scenes, if something changed with their schedule or whatever, where they needed to film something, I needed to be on call pretty much all day, every day for eight months. Right. Right. In case they were going to call you in. Now, right. when you, when you were called in and because I know you mentioned, you know, you, you'd wait and wait and wait and they wouldn't, they wouldn't shoot this, you know, your scene. Um, were on the first day you were there. Um, how long was it until you got to finally do something? Was was it? Oh man, you know, or, I don't know if you remember. I'm trying but. to. I'm I'm trying to remember what it was like the very first day. Um, I mean that first scene the bathroom scene or the, you know, the first, I guess I should say two scenes because the first scene was me kind of out of it. And the second yeah. scene I've kind of come to and covered in the, right in the towel, which is by the way, the only scene I put on my reel um, <laughs> for obvious reasons. Anyway, um, I think altogether it was about, I want to say three weeks shooting all of that. Um, okay. And I can't remember if I, I know that there was a, a, a number of times that I was just, um, you know, I, I'd get there in the morning at like 7 a.m., 6.37, something like that, makeup and hair done. And then I'd go into my, my room at Pinewood and I would just sit and sit and sit and sit, and, you know, read a book and whatever, you know. Um, and I do remember there was at least... I don't know, two or three days. And I don't know which days, but there were at least two or three days where I was pretty much sitting all day. Right. You know, all day. 
Um, but I do remember when I, um, when I first, when right before we were ready to go and do that first scene and the first scene, I was literally starkers. And um, I remember walking in. So they, before we went to film, um, the PA came and got me and took me into Stanley's office. And so I was there, you know, I went, sat down and basically um, Sydney and Tom were also in the office. And, you know, so hello, nice to meet you. Hello, hello, hi, Stanley, you know. And, you know, we're just chatting away about fairly inane stuff. And there was a pause in the conversation. I said, so Stanley, is the reason why you called me in here so that I can meet these guys before I'm totally naked in front of them? And he went, yeah, pretty much. And I said, okay, well, I'm good. Let's just go. Let's just do it. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, yeah. Well, that's nice. They tried to make it somewhat com comfortable. I know, but it was hilarious because it was just so obvious. Right, <laughs> like, right. You know, and I think Stanley appreciated the fact that I was just really upfront about it, you know. <laughs> were you were you able to when you know this this time when you were waiting um were you able to observe other scenes being shot or did no. you not allow that okay no no i, I wasn't no <laughs> i yeah. figured yeah. it's like no if you're not in the scene you're gonna be somewhere else yeah you're not allowed right. to be looking on set yeah and you know okay. and my That's scenes were closed set right yeah right those those first scenes and the and the, uh, the morgue scene, that those were close set. I figured, I figured. Um, what, I, cause I, I've always really liked both, I mean, Sidney Pollack's films and he's also a really good actor. Yeah. Uh, Tom, Tom Cruise as well. I've, I've always really, really liked. Um, what were they like to, to act with? Did they, you know, do take by take? Did they change it up? Did they, what, what, what was it generally? I know it's well, not a so, simple answer always, but. Okay, well. <laughs> there's a few things I remember um in the the first scene where I'm supposedly OD'd and out of it um <laughs> Tom they had I guess they had worked this out without me but Tom was gonna you know look in my mouth and then he was gonna stick his fingers in my mouth to see if there was you know any kind of obstruction I guess doctors would do that and I just remember Tom coming out and he goes now I just want you to know I've washed my hands like three times in anti-antimicrobial <laughs> soap so it's going to be okay okay I've really washed them well I'm like okay I, I trust you <laughs> <laughs> um and so there was that first scene and I didn't really have much input on that I mean the first part of that scene um, I guess the thing that took really the longest was the staging, the lighting, and the camera um, angles and timing. So that took ages. That took absolutely ages. And it was interesting because you had a, there was a light fixture kind of in the, in the room, kind of just a little bit above me. Well, not straight above, it's sort of this over here. And this light fixture had this, it had like, you know, little pieces of like, um, you know, uh, what do you call it? A diffusion paper and then black paper. And, you know, it was, it was this whole kind of conglomeration of little things to get the lighting in the room just perfect, 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 perfect. <laughs> just like, hmm, interesting, that, that contraption up there. And then, you know, just other little things about Stanley would constantly be looking and wanting to just move little things to the right or to the left and just, you know, kind of just staging it so that the visual was exactly mm. specific to what he envisioned or wanted. I mean, even just my, I remember my lip color, even my lip color, um, we had five tries before Stanley was happy with the exact shade that we oh, went wow. I mean, it's, he's very specific about what he wants. It's like oh, extremely. Definitely. Yeah. And, and now was it now in turn, you know, you hear all these stories of, of him doing tons and tons of takes. Was that true? Yes. Yeah. From your experience in that yeah, scene he as did, well? Yeah. He did tons and tons of takes. He did tons and tons of rehearsals and tons and tons of takes. But what was interesting, <laughs> but, but if you understand why, I mean, you know, if he, if he was, so specific about um, what he wanted and the angle that he wanted it. Like that first scene kind of starts further back, right? If yeah. you can imagine, you know, this sort of, I mean, it was, the camera was, it wasn't a handheld this time. It was just, it was on the dolly, you know, the, the big camera on the dolly. 
And so you can imagine them just slowly wheeling forward and then the camera would dip down like this and then it would come forward like this, right? Yeah. But it was the timing in which that happened that made them do it over and over and again. He goes, no, 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 you know, this, you needed to get there faster, the dip needed to be slower, and then you needed to get to here at this point in the scene, et cetera, et cetera. So it was really a matter of, you know, everybody being in the right sync. I mean, I wasn't doing anything, I was just out of it, but you know, what everybody else being exactly at the right timing for, for how that camera moved before it kind of came in on me. So that was indicative, I think, of probably everything that Stanley did, which is why those yes. takes take so long. But, yeah. you know, on one hand, you might think, oh, this is a real pain in the ass. But at the same time, you think, well, you know, if you were a director and you wrote it and you were producing it and it was your baby, I mean, why wouldn't you want to be? And you had the money and the time to do it. Yes. Why wouldn't you want to be that specific? I would. Right. I totally would. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm way detail oriented. So if little things are out of place, it would really piss me off. So I think Stanley was very similar in that respect. And, um, and so, you know, that's why those things happened again and again. Right. The other thing that was interesting though, is, and I have talked about this before, but I'll say it again. The second scene where I'm actually speaking, the original, um, the original uh, script, was something like, um, oh, you know, how are you doing, Mandy? And I just said, better. That's right. it. And so I remember, you know, we, we had worked out the scene and, you know, Tom and Sydney had their exchange. And then Tom said that to me and I said, better. And we were rehearsing and I said, you know, I said, I feel like I want to say this. And Sydney would say, I'm Tom, I'm sorry, Stanley would say, okay, all right, do that. And then, and then, so I said my bit and then Tom said, well, you know, if she's saying this, I'm going to say this. I feel like I want to say this. And then Sydney would say, well, you know, if they're going to do this. So basically um, the three of us and Stanley kind of rewrote that scene while we were re rehearsing it. And so it became oh, wow. something different than what it was on the page. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, like, I, I'm not surprised to hear that in, in a sense, because if you, when you go look at that documentary, his daughter made uh, on the set of The Shining and Jack Nicholson was joking that they were constantly rewriting the scenes, you know, constantly. Okay, so, so it makes sense. Yeah. 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 So I'm not surprised that. I mean, uh, I, I just think that it was important for Stanley is that if, let's see, how can I say this? When I suggested those things, it wasn't out of my ego. It was just out of what I, what my gut instinct was telling me to say right. or do. Yeah. And, you know, I, I didn't really think, I mean, you know, I think some people, maybe if they were amongst those people, I mean, I'm, I'm amongst like film giants and who, who am I, you know, I'm just this little jobbing fashion model that was plucked out of nowhere so you know and other people I guess might have been really nervous really nervous to say things or do anything other than you know what they're told or whatever but I kind of looked at it like this um that you know I was hired to do a job and doing that I wanted to do that job to the best of my ability and whatever it took you know so if I felt like my character needed to say or do something more then that's why I would say it I, I didn't feel afraid because I thought you know what we're all here we're all here to do this job and we're all here to do this job hopefully to the best of our ability and to make Stanley happy right yes. satisfied yeah. with the job that he's hired us to do and so I didn't look at Tom or Sydney or Stanley in the way of like oh you yeah, know I just right. I didn't I didn't feel that way because I just thought well you know, I just wanted to, to make to make it the best it could be, basically. Well, well, good uh, good for you to really just take ownership of the part and contribute and not, like you said, just wait for instructions yeah. because these people are giants, right? Because yeah. I, 
yeah, I know what you mean. I think, you know, a lot of people would be, uh, uh, would be intimidated. Yeah. Yeah. Intimidated. But I mean, it sounds like they created an atmosphere also to yeah. make you feel comfortable to, yeah. to do that. So, yeah. um, which is great as well. Now, what, 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 what was he like specifically in terms of directions? Did he ask for specific changes with each take or what? How did Not he really. Actors? Not really. I mean, it was really more, um, you know, through onset rehearsal and then, um, I guess he, he liked the timing of it. He liked the, the feel of it. And he would just say, okay, you know, let's, let's, let's do this for real, you know, let's shoot it. But was funny, uh, what was funny is that um, at one point, you know, we had done a bunch of takes and then we had all sat down and looked at the playback. And then at one point it was Tom that actually said to Stanley, so you know what, Stanley, can we just do it one more time? Let's just do it one more time. I know so you wouldn't expect that, right? Yeah. So it wasn't, it wasn't just um, Stanley wanting to do take up to take, but Tom wanted to right. get it right too. I love and that. And the other thing I will say um, about Tom that I really admired, and, and it's interesting because I remember when the initial, uh, the initial audition, Leon was saying, and you know, um, this is starring Tom Cruise. <laughs> and I said to him, I said, so I said, I'm, I'm mainly just interested in working with Stanley. <laughs> I mean, because, you know, I saw Tom previous to that. It's like, yeah, you know, he's like very commercial actor. And, you know, he just does big blockbusters and yada, yada, yada. You know, you know, I wasn't I wasn't it was it wasn't like I was like, ooh, Tom. Cruise. You know, I just didn't feel that way. Right. Right. But after working with him, um, he is he's a wonderful actor. Yeah, his he is. ego, his ego. I mean, I know you hear stories and things, but I didn't notice that he had this massive ego. I will say that his persona was bigger than life, right? But I didn't right. notice that his um, his ego was, you know, it's like, well, she can't say that, and you know, I'm Tom Cruise. Yeah, you know, I just didn't, I just didn't gather that from him. And so I would say he's really focused. He's an excellent actor. And even when the camera was not on him, he didn't have a stand in. When the, when the close up was on me, he was there giving it his all so that my performance would be good and believable. And he could have had a stand in, right? right. He could have done, you know, if he was going to be a prima donna, he could have done that. And then the other little, this is just a little side note. So here we are in between takes or whatever, and we're just taking a quick break and we're hanging out just outside set. And there's a little craft table kind of around the corner that I didn't know where it was. And Tom comes up and we're chatting away and he's eating a granola bar. And I went, oh, where did you get that? And he goes, well, it's at the craft table just around the, and then I go, oh, really? And he goes, do you want me to get one for you? And I'm like, oh, could you? <laughs> and he did. So that was nice. You know, I mean, he's not, that's what I mean about Tom. He's, I would, I would jump at the chance to work with him again. I'll say that. And we had fun, great, um, even intense conversations about various things. And, um, you know, I mean, you, I didn't feel like you could get too personal. So if I was right. asking something that was a little bit too personal about he and Nicole, he right. would kind of pull back a little bit. So I kind of, I thought, okay. And I understand that because who am I? I'm this unknown actor. He doesn't know what I'm going to say or do. Um, and so, you know, and you, you have to, um, you have to respect that because you don't know, um, you have to protect your, your privacy to a certain extent. Right. So. Right. Of course. Yeah. Well, that, that's so good. That's so good to hear. And I, I know, cause I, I know what you mean because I, I used to feel that way about him as well. But then when I saw him on his Inside the Actors Studio episode, he spoke so passionately about acting. Mm -hmm. And he just, I was like, man, this guy really loves to act. He does. <laughs> like, and then he when does. I went through his performances more, I mean, this was when I was, you know, in, in my teens and I always just wrote him off. And then I was like, wow, he's actually, he is actually an excellent actor. And I thought he was great. He, and I was like, he is, wow. I mean, total commitment, you know? Yeah. And what I used to think about him being, um, you know, this commercial quote, sellout actor, not selling out at all. I mean, he is the kind of guy that would go to an action movie, 
and be sitting there with, you know, a giant popcorn and a soft drink. And go, you know, I mean, he yeah. really is that kind of a guy. So um, the fact that he would do those sorts of films, I mean, that wasn't him just, you know, selling out for money kind of thing. I just think right. he was really into that stuff. Yeah. And he loves, you know, he loves racing and flying and stunts and all he loves that stuff i mean he totally digs it so yeah, he's he going does. after his passion yes yeah no absolutely and did you get to know pollock much much at all uh at all, Sydney Pollock. All, yeah Sydney pollock, i mean yeah. you know chatted to him as well and he was lovely and you know told me a few little tidbits about tootsie um like comedy little comedy tidbits like he was saying he was saying, do you remember the scene about, you know, where they were going in for a close up on, what was her name, Dorothy? Was it Dorothy, I think? Who, Dustin Hoffman? Yeah, well, yeah, the woman, as when Dorothy, he was, when he was you know, the with woman, the yeah. The, well, yeah. Yes. yeah. And, uh, and so they pulled in for a close up and, you know, it's like nightmarish and, and they said, and then the producer said, pull back, pull, set, pull back. And, and the other guy said, well, how far? And he said, how about Cleveland? Oh, right, right. So when he when he was telling me that, he said it had to be a hard word, like K, Cleveland, right? It couldn't be, you know, how about, I don't know, Memphis. It, he said it wouldn't have had the same impact. It had to have that hard sound in order for you to find the funny in it. And I just thought that was a nice little interesting tidbit, you know, that he told me about that. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I could see... I can't articulate why that would be, but I see what he means. I think so something about the, uh, the hardness of a, of a city like Cleveland and it just has an extra punch to it. I don't know why, yeah. but yeah. Anyway, that's interesting. Yeah. Wow. And but they now, were both lovely. They were respectful. We worked well together. You know, the scene went well, scenes uh, went well and um, right. yeah, it was all good. Now the, the scenes, you know, because there's these different things you hear about in the, you know, party slash orgy scene of uh, this act. Uh, now, was she an actor, Abigail Good, who yeah. did like what now? Because no. everyone says it was her, but I always thought so, that was you. OK, so it's my character. It's your character, um, right? Yep. And um, so, I mean, this is always just I, I, I actually hate talking about this, but it's easier to talk about it and just tell the truth of what happened than, you know, make up something. And um, I think when, when the film first came out, you know, nobody advised me on what to say and what, what not to say. So I didn't really know what to do. Um, you know, I had one really awful interview. Somebody called me on my private line at like six in the morning and I was kind of bumbling for what to say and uh, anyway. Um, so, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I won't take too much of your viewers time, but basically no. what happened is we had been rehearsing. Um, we had all been in this circle um, rehearsing that initial kind of ritual scene for a month before, um, just before they started filming. And, oh, by the way, if anybody's interested, why... Um, my character ended up with this feather mask. I chose it. Oh, there you I go. There's it. a bit of trivia. I don't think anyone yep. knows. <laughs> well, basically, um, you know, before we put, before the, I guess there were something like 10 girls or 12 girls. Is it 12? I can't remember, but you know, in the circle. Something like that. Yeah. Um, so at one point we, we breaked and Stanley had me come up and he had all the masks displayed um, on this table or these tables because there was a lot of masks and I think he had chosen a number of them for, to be on the featured girls that were in the circle and um, and so he said so Julianne which one which one do you like which one would you want and so I chose the feather mask I thought it was the most beautiful and the most striking good choice um, yeah it was a good choice. And, and then that feather mask, um, it's the, some of the aspects of the mask, and you'll laugh at this, at this again, that was painted and repainted. The lip colors were painted different colors and everything until it was perfect. <laughs> and then while we were rehearsing, when the 12 girls would peel off, 
my character, Mandy, me in the feather mask, went off with Tom, started walking down that, oh, before we started walking down the hallway, there was a bit where we go to kiss our masks. Right. I just remember as I went up and I said, don't really touch the mask because the paint's still wet. <laughs> I remember saying oh, this God. through my mask. Um, yeah, so all of that happened and, you know, I was wearing that mask and everything was great. But here's what happened. Um, so all this time that we were kneeling up and down, I invite your viewers, especially your female viewers, to wear four and a half to five and a half inch heels and to kneel down and get back up on one knee with high heels. Oh God. Many, many, many times. And you know, maybe it was on me. Maybe I was not fit enough, but basically what happened is I injured my fascia, which is oh, no. the muscle kind of on the side bit of your, um, of your thigh. You know, like not the right. front of your thigh, but like the side bit, the outer side bit of my thigh. So I injured my fascia and I was struggling um, to get up. And Stanley noticed that I was struggling and he asked me what was wrong. And I said, you know, I think I pulled a muscle. I said, but don't worry, I'll be fine. And we were going to break for two days. And by the time I came back, I, I said, look, I'm fine. You know, I was taking codeine and what was it? Like I was taking codeine and um, I think Tylenol and codeine, something like that. Coproximal, right. that's the word that they used in England. I was taking coproximal. I remember running to my GP in England going, okay, I need to not feel anything. Please give me something. You know that I don't like to take drugs, but please give me this so that I don't mess up. <laughs> right. So I had come back and I was, I was fine. I was able to do it and I didn't have any pain and, you know, but Stanley was still nervous about it. Mm. And so, um, two things happened around this time. Um, so they, well, first of all, they put an, another wig on me just in case, cause they wanted to make my own hair thicker. So they, they cut off like quite a sizable chunk from underneath, like, like a chunk about this size and made a whole fall of my exact hair color, matched it exactly. And, and I was wearing that on top of my hair. Okay. Right. Just to thicken it out. <clears throat> and then one night at the end of another rehearsal, um, all the girls um, plus the one guy, you know, that was in the, the guy with the, with the um, incense thing. So we yeah. were all on the bus ready to go back to the hotel because we were, the, the stately home was in Norfolk, right? So we went to go back to our hotel and it was about, we were doing very late starts and late nights. So we were, at our, our hours were like 2, 2 p.m. to 2 a.m. So it was about 2.30 at this point. And we were all in the bus and then Leon comes onto the bus and he says, Hey, um, Julianne, Stanley needs you to come on, come into his um, trailer and try on G strings, different G strings for him. Because, you know, we were still wearing those G strings when we were all walking. Right. Yeah. And right. He, he needs you to come and try on various G strings for him. And so my, my first reaction was, Really? I mean, you know, it's 2.30 in the morning and why would I need to try on G-strings this late at night all alone? He goes, don't worry, you know, we'll have the driver take you back to the hotel after. I don't know, my gut just didn't like the sound of it. And I was tired. And so I said, no. Oh. I said, you know what, Leon, I said, I'm sorry. I'm not, you know, I mean, I do it tomorrow, maybe, but I just, I don't want to do it now. So we went out, chatted and he goes, no, Stanley really needs you tonight now. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not, I'm not doing it. Abigail, I'll do it. Oh no. Oh, so, wow. Wow. So that's what, okay. Okay. Gee, I wasn't expecting that. That's what happens. God's honest truth. That's what happened. 
So. Oh God. So so sometimes it was you. So basically, her. the wig that they had fashioned for me just to thicken out my own hair, they then stuck on her. She's well, not I don't know what color her natural hair is, but she's blonde usually. Right. And um, and yeah, so they took her mask and put me in her mask and her in my mask. And what's really interesting as well is that in the scenes where we're all peeled off and we're walking down that hallway, if you look right. directly behind my character, Mandy, I right. am directly behind me. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. So my God. character is the one in the mask that was like this. Yes, right. That's my, that was, you know, not my character, this other extra, because Abby was a featured extra. Right. So she right. basically was my stand in because I injured myself. Right. And then, right. you know, they used her for the rest of those scenes. I, so, so it's a combination the, of you and her. Right. So, the, so okay. the other, the other thing that was, but you know, I was in the initial ritual scene. I was in, right. And the walking down the hallway and all of that. But then when they cut to the orgy scenes, that's a whole other thing that happened. Oh, <laughs> I have God. to say, Stanley's, Stanley's damn good. He knows what he's doing. Stanley's a very smart man. I respect him hugely. Um, and being a producer myself now and being a co-producer on projects and associate producer on projects, I've, be, because of that knowledge now, I totally understand that he's going to do or any, you know, any director producer that, you know, really wants his baby to be the best of his vision or her vision, you're going to do whatever is necessary regardless of loyalty and i agree with that because you know there's a point where uh, are you going to be loyal to somebody if it lets the production down in some way or another you know or if you can't rely on them so i can't blame stanley for wanting to get somebody else and clearly abby was very willing right um so you know i i i, I understand that I understand mm. his reasoning because he didn't know if my leg was going to get worse. And then all of a sudden, uh oh, you know, she can't walk now. Right. So I totally understand. Right. It was very upsetting for me at the time. Extremely oh, I, upsetting. I imagine. Yeah. Lots of imagine. tears and crying. I was very upset. I oh, was very I upset. It was not, it was you. not, it was not good. It was not fun. Right. No, I don't blame you. Yeah, I don't blame you at all. When, yeah. when sorry, when you said in the the orgy scene, you oh, said yeah. there's so, some other oh, story yeah, there. Other okay. So yeah, okay. So this is what happened. Stanley, um, just you know, he had the um, the uh, the choreographer. Um, she, let's see, how can I say this quickly? Um, they would have these kind of training sessions, stroke dance um, classes, stroke rehearsals. Okay. And they had these things for months. Like they would meet every week for months leading up to the, the ritual scene and the orgy scene. So all the guys that were in the, in those scenes and all the girls that were in those scenes would be going to these, you know, class rehearsal things for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. Okay. Um, so Leon came up to me and he said, um, so this is what we're doing. And he said, you know, it's just to kind of um, discover movements and whatever. And, you know, um, just so you guys can kind of get to know each other and stuff like that. Um, and so, you know, would you go to one of these, um, you know, would you go to these classes? And I said, okay, sure, you know, sure, let's do it. Um, but so, oh, and I'll, I'll say one other thing. So Stanley said, you know, I'm going to have you guys work with the, you know, oh, Stanley pulled me away privately and he said, um, so I want you to go to these kind of class rehearsal whatevers. And he said, basically, it's just kind of, he goes, it's going to be sort of like erotic dancing with the inference of sex, but no, and he said, and this is what he did. And I've done this before for other people too. I mean, I'm talking to him just like this. And he goes, he said, so it's gonna be erotic dancing with the inference of sex, 
but there's going to be none of this. <laughs> right. That's what he did. I mean, he did, he did that. Right. And I went, okay. Mind you, one other little tidbit. A few years before this, I had been sexually assaulted on the street. In London. And so oh, I was feeling a little bit more um, vulnerable than I used to feel uh, after that incident. So I was still, I mean, it took me kind of years to get over that, you know? Right. So I was still, I, I wasn't raped, but it was, it was close. It was, it oh was God. Bad. I'm sorry to anyway, hear that. Yeah, it was bad. Um, anyway, so, you know, I went to these, these class things, you know, we had a, it was like a dance class, you know, we had like a warm up and, you know, and then we all paired off into groups. So we'd have some girls with guys and, you know, maybe, and then I, and the other thing I said, is I said, you know, I mean, Leon was saying, okay, you know, how can we make this good or whatever? Cause I told him about the fact that I had been assaulted a few years before and I was still kind right. of, uh, um, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm good with that as long as it's just me and a couple other girls. I said, I just don't feel comfortable kind of like moving around that close when we're again, topless in a G string. Okay. And the guys were in their boxer shorts. Mm -hmm. moving around like you know kind of erotically with a guy I just I just like uh, you know uh, just because I felt vulnerable um, right of course so I agreed to do these things with two women and and I thought I would be okay but what was weird is that you know we all would perform in front of each other and so even though we, I was moving around kind of you know erotically with these two other women they were all, other people were all staring at me, right. including the guys. And I was like, oh man, this just, oh, I just was feeling really uncomfortable about mm -hmm. it. And so, mm -hmm. so I, I, you know, I, so Leon at the end of it, he goes, so how, how did it go? And I said, you know what, Leon, I said, I'm really sorry. I hate to do this. And then, and I, and I told him, and I said, look, because I feel really uncomfortable because of what happened to me. And I, I'm still dealing with that. And I just felt really uncomfortable moving around like that with having like the guys watching me and stuff. And I just said, I just, it's not a matter. And I did say this literally, I said, it's not a matter of, I won't. I said, it's a matter of, I can't. It just felt so, uh, right. It just felt really wrong to me. I just, I just felt so uncomfortable. Um, and he said, okay. And then Stanley talked to me again. Um, you know, pulled me aside and he said, look, he goes, I really, really, really want you to do this. He said, because you have the best body and I want, so that was nice of him. Nice little compliment there. You have the best <laughs> right. body and I just really need you to be in these scenes. And I'm like, ah, Stanley, please don't ask me to do that. I just feel so uncomfortable. I just feel so uncomfortable moving like that. So fast forward to after the ritual scene, after months and months of all these people getting to know each other really, really well, right? I mean, they're moving around with each other. They're going out for, you know, coffee afterwards, right? So they're all right. super chummy, right? Right. So let me ask you, if you were a director producer and your intention all along was to have this, but you were hiring not porn people, not glamour TNA models, but fashion models. How are you going to do it? It's kind of genius, really. Yeah. Right? Because oh, you get people so comfortable, they think, you know, you just kind of move those little goalposts. Right, right. Right? Remove the barriers a little bit more. <clears throat> and then it's like, oh. So when. <laughs> So right when the, you know, when we were nearly finished doing the ritual scenes, Jan Harlan, who, by the way, I still, you know, we kind of, anyway, Jan Harlan came up to everybody in the circle and he said, um, listen, there's going to be a few changes um, with the, the scenes that are coming after, which they called the orgy scenes. Okay. Right. He said, so, you know, initially it was going to be topless G-string, high heels, and the men were going to be wearing boxer shorts, right? But he said, 
now it's going to be no boxer shorts, no, nothing on the man except for a cup, you know, taped on to cover his bits. And um, the women were going to be completely naked. And there would be this. Right. And I mean, they must have been so pissed off at me. But I then, you know, Jan walked away and I said to all the girls, I said, listen, girls, I said, this is a big change. Mm. I said, you know, first of all, I said, up to you if you want to do it, if you feel comfortable doing it, fine, go for it, whatever. I said, but in my opinion, you should be getting more money for that. Right. Oh, certainly. Right. So I said that. <clears throat> um, and, uh, and I said, and you know, I said, Jan is going to call each one of you. Um, and so, you know, it's up to you what you want to do, but all of them caved. They did it and they did it for the mm -hmm. same money. God. Well, it, it makes me wonder why, why didn't they just get like porn stars or so like people who were be comfortable doing it right off the um, bat? Well, I would say because there was a number of reasons. One, he wanted women that were long and lean and looked elegant. Um, he uh, wanted women who weren't overly buxom. Um, and he also wanted women with real breasts. Ah, I see, I see. So, so your best you know, he, is so he just, right. you know, he wanted them long, lean. If you can imagine, I mean, um, the highest end, highest paid escorts, they tend to be quite beautiful, right? Right. Right. And they tend to do, they, they tend to look like fashion models, the highest, right. you're talk, I'm I talking like you're the, saying. you know, the $10,000 a night kind of escorts tend to look stunningly gorgeous and they're elegant and they're well put together, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And so because right. of the whole thing behind, um, you know, the sort of secret society of the uber wealthy, et cetera, et cetera he's going to want the women to look like fashion models mm, and not mm, like see. glamour TNA models, you know? Oh. I mean, I will say there was, there was one girl who was, I think a glamour model, but she was stunning. And in fact, he used her, he used her in a scene. Um, you know, the doctor scene when he, where the yes, girl's topless and he's got the stethoscope. Yeah. At the yeah. yeah. Yeah, she did do a lot of glamour, but she was stunning. God, what a beautiful girl. Um, but yeah, for the most part, no. All the everybody else was fashion model. Yeah. Oh wow. I did not expect any of this. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> no, no, yeah. I I no, Well, I, you know I mean, what? It's like if yeah. you're not I just look at it this way. Um, if I'm not honest with the interviews I get about what happened then I'm going to get confused. Like, oh, what did I say the last time was, you know, right. get my lie straight or whatever. And it's just easier for me to, you know, say what I remember happened. Right. And, um, you know, and then I, I don't get caught out on anything. Right, yeah. right. Well, so good. I, I mean, just believe good. in being truthful. No, good for you. And, and good for you to not feel the peer pressure to just cave. And, and I can understand why someone would, but it's much harder yeah, to be like, I mean, I'm not going to do it. And yeah. I will say, and I will say, you know, I, I ran into, um, I think it was Kate Sharman. I think it was Kate that was saying this. Um, after they shot the, the orgy scenes, right? And I said, I said, you know, I said, how did that go? How was it? And she said, well, she's, you know, there were a few times that it was pretty grim. Um, he said there was one girl, I think there's one scene where the girl's on the, there's, she's on like a chaise or a couch and the guy's like pounding into her. Yeah. Oh, I'm, yeah. Right. Well, underneath her mask, she was crying. Oh my God. So oh, I'm just, no. yeah. So, I mean, even all that lead up, um, of trying to get them comfortable. I think, I think some of those girls had a hard time. You know, it would have been easier for Stanley if he had just gotten a bunch of porn people. It would have yeah. been like, no problem. Do you want me to do real sex or what? You know. <laughs> oh my God, we're gonna get we're gonna get this movie canceled when this. <laughs> I know this is so. It's like you know that's heavy, but but you know what? I mean, 
look, Stanley needed to show that really, right, if you think right. about it, if you think about, you know, the dark side of this, the dark side of, um, of these kinds of, you know, sex parties and secret societies and, you know, Illuminati or whatever, right? All of these kind of ritual things that have magic with a K in it, all that kind of stuff. A lot of it involves sex magic. Mm. And, um, you know, it's not going to be, it's not going to be tender and loving, is it? It's not. Right. You know? No, of course not. And so I think Stanley needed to show it. And he also needed to show the um, objectification of these women. Right. You know, and, and the life of Mandy Curran, I mean, you look at the tragedy of the life of Mandy Curran. Oh, yeah. And that yeah. really, I mean, you think about what happened to this girl, you know, how she got went down this road. I mean, because this is a girl who at one point, you know, was just doing um, uh, beauty pageants. And somewhere along the way, you know, and this is never inferred. You, you just you just never know. You don't know if if I was abused when I was younger or or whatever or, you know, some boyfriend abused me and made sure that I had a really low self-esteem. I mean, who knows? Who knows how women go from, you know, either being models or even glamour models and then moving into porn or moving into right. escorts. I mean, who knows? But, or going to these sex parties or whatever. It's like, I don't know how that happens, but, um, but they do say a lot of times it happens through abuse and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I think that it was important to show the tragedy yeah. um, behind all this, you know, and, and obviously a lot of those girls are going to do drugs because it's a coping me mechanism. You need right, to numb, course. you need to numb the pain and numb the fact that, you know, what the hell am I doing? What am I doing with my life? What have I done with my life? What am I doing mm -hmm. to myself? You know? Right. Right. Well, you know, in a, in a way, you know, cause before I knew the fact that it was, uh, you and then and this this other Abigail Good um, it, cause I I had always suspected that was some I was like is that someone else and in a way it kind of works with the whole surrealist nature of it cause like the whole film has this dreamlike sequence so it's kind yeah. of like is this all in Tom you know some people interpret well, it and she was thing. wearing my perfectly matched hair so right. that's a yeah. dead giveaway that you know I mean they can call it the mysterious woman but I mean it was me with my hair you know, right. so that's true. And that's true. Stanley, that character was supposed to be one and the same character. So, right. You know, right. And Do Abigail couldn't. So here's the thing. And then you're going to ask this. So I'm just going to jump to it. Was that you voicing it? In right. a word, no. And the right. reason is, I think Stanley was pissed off. I mean, I turned him down twice and people don't turn Stanley down for anything. I was wondering. I yeah. turned him down for the orgy scenes and I turned him down for the late night G-string trying on session alone in his trailer. God. You know, yeah. and it's like, he was pissed off, I'm sure. It's like, don't, you know, right. I've asked you to do something. You should say yes, anytime, you know? Right. And I just, you know, I bless him. I'm not, I'll never know. I'll never know. I'm not, I wasn't a fly on the wall. I don't know. Um, bless him for being such a very smart man. There's things I know about him now that I wish we had, and things that I know now that I wish uh, there's a whole bunch of conversations I would love to have with that man. I'm really, really grateful for him giving the opportunity. In fact, I heard much later on that Warner's was not happy about the fact that he had plucked somebody from obscurity. They wanted a bigger, well-known model. Right? Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, I wow. think at one point, Ava Heretskova was tagged to do it, but she didn't want to do it because of all the nudity. Right. 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 Um, so, you know, I'm eternally grateful for, for Stanley um, picking me out of obscurity. I mean, it definitely changed my life. Big time, oh. changed my life. Yeah, certainly. And yeah. and for any so anyway, so getting five, sorry, five, I, you know, I totally segued. 
So getting back to the whole voice thing. Right. They were pissed off. And if you look at where my name is in the credits, it's way the hell down there when the rolling credits are on. They were pissed off. They were doing the minimal amount at that point. And, you know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry they were pissed off, but um, I just, I had my level, you know, and I wasn't going to be, I wasn't going to be cajoled or convinced to go beyond the level that I was comfortable with. Right. And that's that. That's it. And I, I don't regret that. I, I still do not regret those decisions that I made. I right. mean, I wish he had used me anyway. Um, I, I think I would have been better all, you know, I would have been able to do the voice and everything, but it is what it is. But the voice right. is not Abigail either. Abigail could not do um, an American, she couldn't American, do an American right. accent. Yeah. Right. So they got Kate, Kate Blanchett. Yeah. Is, is, uh, and it's so funny because I, yeah. I remember I saw Kate at a, a party, I think it was early on, like around September um, for some jewelry company. I can't remember which one. Um, but there's a picture of us somewhere on the internet of Kate and me next to each other at a party. And I didn't even realize that she had voiced it. And I, I you know, I mean, it was, you know, she knew, but I didn't know. I'm like, hmm, why didn't she say something? <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Yeah, but it was oh, all wow. very, I mean, I think it wasn't really common knowledge for quite a long time. I think yeah, this came was out, only just come out and I'm not sure when. Yeah, but so I think maybe she, long. you know, maybe she wasn't told to do that. But I think, I, I honestly think they were just pissed off at me. Mm. You know? Because mm. Stanley knew what I could do. I mean, I'd rehearsed right. the bloody thing enough times. Right. You know, but I just think yeah. they were pissed off. Right. What can I say? Right. You know? Right. Oh, God. Well, again, you know, good for you for sticking to your guns and doing what you agreed to and not. Yeah. I mean, and, and at the end of the day, I don't know. I don't feel like it's diminished. You know, it's still my character. Right. Yeah. No, um, not at all. Yeah. No, it's so, not at all. Yeah. Not at all. And, and, and my and life I, still changed. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, it probably would have been the same. If, you know, had I done those scenes, I think the changes in my life would have happened regardless if I had done those yeah. initial scenes or not. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think so. And uh, you, I, you told this amusing story about the, the, when you first saw it at the premiere. So, oh. so when you're, so, uh, <laughs> do, you mind, do you mind sharing that again? Just yeah. to mention everyone gasp when they first saw it. <laughs> they did. So, I mean, we're talking like star studded premiere. And I think my husband and I were sitting in like the fourth or the fifth row. And I do, I remember this the entire audience, as soon as it cut to me, like, slumped in the chair <laughs> literally the entire audience went <gasps> like that I'm like oh shit <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was it was kind of it was like oh wow you know i mean it was oh, freaky God. well and it was freaky oh, seeing God. myself you know on that but i'm like whoa that was you know <laughs> <laughs> oh god that's quite the story i know yeah. not and i had movie. no idea what to expect too because i had i hadn't seen the film before it came out i mean that was my first time oh. seeing it at the premiere you know right. the one in westwood yeah first time right that's incredible so it's like not only is it a major movie by a major director with major stars uh seeing yourself on the on the big screen but also having that reaction that's quite, i know i know it's kind something. of freaky that the world has seen me naked but at the same time but at the same time it's they, at least they saw me naked at a really great time of my life when i looked really good <laughs> So, you know, and I didn't do anything, as I would say, untoward with my nakedness. Right. I, know. I mean, I've never really done a sex scene or, you know, I haven't done that sort of thing. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, you know, and also in a really good movie. You know? Yeah. <laughs> it's such a good movie as well. Yeah. What, what I know. You, what, I mean, that's why I say, I mean, I feel blessed. I'm, I'm blessed that, that Stanley chose me and also you know, with the years leading up after that, I um, experienced um, a level of fame and a part of kind of the world that he was sort of trying to explain. Not that I was going to sex parties or anything, but with the circles that I was running in and the parties that I was going to and the things I was invited to, I was definitely running with and exposed to a lot of the kinds of elites that he was mm -hmm. kind of inferring. Thank you.
in the film. Um, and so I really got a good taste of that. I got a good taste of the lifestyle that they lead. And I got a good taste of fame too. Right. So, and that, all of that was a very interesting learning mm -hmm. curve. Yeah. Oh, I bet. Well, this has been such a great conversation, Julian. Thank you so much for coming and sharing in such great detail. <laughs> <laughs> these, you're welcome yeah uh, stories I, I really appreciate it and I know that Kubrick fans will eat this up <laughs> you know this is such great I, I know you've <laughs> talked about it before I, I read other interviews with you but uh this there there's so much here that I didn't know so this was this was so great so thank you so much for doing this you're welcome you're welcome it's been fun it's always fun Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. I want to thank all of my members on Patreon. If you're interested in becoming a member of my Patreon, head over to the link, patreon.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies for full details. And if this is your first time here on my YouTube channel, please consider subscribing by pressing the Robert Bellissimo at the movies logo. You will see it floating above my head in the top left corner. To your top left, in just a second, just click on that. And then click the bell in order to get a notification every time I release one of my new episodes. Please click the like button below. We'll see you in the next episode.